All right, so let's talk about this thing of courageous faith. Scripture, all throughout the Scripture, and church history are filled with examples of men and women who lived courageous lives. They overcame fears, faults, and failures to live lives of courageous faith. Did anybody have any fears, faults, or failures in the room? So you're qualified to live a life of courageous faith, right? God doesn't choose, you know, the, the qualified. He actually calls us, we respond, and then he qualifies the broken. He begins to restore us. It's amazing what he does, right? And so courageous faith sees opportunity and contradiction. It looks at chaos and says there's opportunity in this contradiction. It is a faith which deflects chaos and releases God's peace in a turbulent world. How many of you know we need to release peace right now, right? Courageous faith provides hope in darkness. So to truly live this Christian life that we're called to live, it's more than just, you know, living with good Christian character, although absolutely that's foundational. It's more than just, you know, attending church occasionally. It, it, it is about living this life in the Spirit, where we're living by His Word and we're living by the Spirit, to live a life of risky faith. Risky faith means we're willing to step out of the boat when Jesus is on the water and he asks us to come, despite the turbulent waters. And so Jesus invites us on something of courageous faith that if we will embrace this, we will live a life full of joy, peace, and victory. Now I'm going to get to the story of Caleb here in a minute, and, uh, but I want to build on this a little bit. Now how many of you men and maybe a lot of you ladies saw the 90s movie Braveheart with Mel Gibson in it, right? Some of you remember that? Oh, some of you are like, oh, yeah, okay. Well, it's interesting because Mel Gibson plays a 13th century Scottish uh, leader, plays the part of a Scottish leader, William Wallace, in their struggle against freedom against the English. The English were oppressing the Scots. It was a very oppressive uh, time. And the movie actually portrays, in one of the most poignant scenes of the movie, prior to this battle, it was actually the Battle of Stirling Bridge, 11th of September, 1297, Wallace or Mel Gibson, but this is the actual words from William Wallace. Uh, I don't know if they're exactly like this in the movie, but close. Gave this powerful speech to motivate his soldiers. And here are a few words from his speech. He says, we all end up dead. It's just a question of how and why. He said, every man dies. Not every man really lives. I am William Wallace. And I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men, and free men you are. What will you do with that freedom? Will you fight? Now, they went on, and under his leadership of Wallace, they were able to defeat the English. Now, they had some setbacks, but they were able to break the chains of tyranny. Now, I don't want you to think in terms of physical conflict this morning or war. I want you to think in terms of the spiritual battle that we're all in. There are two kingdoms opposed to one another, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So these words of Wallace, they compel us today in this spiritual sense. Each of us are faced with challenges and problems. Some are spiritual. Other problems occur from living in a fallen world. So what do we do? You see, we are free to choose. We are choose to fight the good fight of faith, or we are choose to accept defeat and acquiesce into passivity or complacency. But he bids us to go further. He's asking us to live a life of courageous faith. Jesus, our champion, freed us from our sin, our past, and our failures. Don't surrender your freedom to negativity, fear, hatred, jealousy, anger, greed, etc. That's not living victoriously. Rather, live from Christ's peace, from his love, from his joy, from his faith, from his courage, and live positive, full of positivity while facing problems and battles. Then you and I will truly live. You see, you have been given, you and I have been given God's faith, God's spirit, God's promises, and God's authority. Expect impossible situations to change as you prevail in faith and prayer. When you have God's promise on a matter, Pray in faith and speak with confidence. Believe the promise is received and on its way. That's faith and hope in what is not yet seen. 
Now let's talk for a couple minutes about some biblical exhortations to have courage. In the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, we see Moses instructing the children of Joshua and as well as the children of Israel. He says this, he says, be strong and of good courage. Now he's talking about you've, you've come out of Egypt, you're possessing this land. He said, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. You see, God can ask you and I to a life of risky faith or courageous faith. He can ask us to the impossible because he is with us always. He gives the same passage and same words to Joshua in Joshua 1.9. Most of you are familiar with that. He says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So again, same thing. Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. The Lord's with you. We see the same words in 1 Chronicles uh, 22, verse 13. I, I love this. David is using the same words to his son Solomon. He's talking about how he would prosper. He says, If you take care to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be dismayed. If, if there's a message that fathers can give their children or another generation, and, and some of you are not fathers or in, in the natural sense, but you're spiritual fathers or maybe will be natural fathers one day, at any rate, what we should impart to this other this generation is be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Because you see, every generation has had conflicts in dark times. Be strong and of good courage. I love what the angel says to Daniel in Daniel 10, uh, 19. How would you like to have an angel show up and speak these words to you? Oh man, greatly beloved. This is to Daniel. Fear not. He wouldn't have told him fear not if Daniel wasn't struggling with fear. And I don't know about you, but if we're all honest in the room, male and female alike, we've all struggled with fear at some point. Where we needed to be strong and of good courage, where there was something that was causing us to not be at peace. He says, do not, he says, fear not, peace be to you. See, the opposite of fear is peace. So the angel imparts peace. Peace to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, this is what Daniel said. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then God continues to speak through the angel. Jesus says to Paul in Acts 23, 11, be of good cheer. That can also be translated from the Greek, take courage. Take courage, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. To the church, I would say today, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, for the Lord is with you always. The dictionary defines the English word courage as the ability to do something that frightens one. The ability to do something that frightens one. The English word courageous, I love this definition, it's defined as not deterred by danger or pain, brave. To be courageous means that you're not deterred by danger ahead of you or behind you or pain, suffering. You know there's suffering in this life, right? But you face it with courage. And you're brave. You see, the church is called to be a change agent in a broken world. I am so glad that somewhere along in my journey, there were elders and leaders in churches that were courageous, that kept fighting the good fight of faith, to to maintain Christian community, to, to build church culture and allow a place where Jesus could be known and the presence of God could permeate so that my life and other lives could be impacted. 
And so it is through 2,000 years of church history. And so he beckons us once again, yes, in a difficult moment in time in our society and around the world, but he beckons us once again, will you be a change agent? Will you be courageous in this hour? This means we must live confident in Christ. We must be willing to risk, not deterred, brave. You see, I see my kids, I see my grandkids, but I see the grandkids of a city. I see the grandkids of a nation. How about you today? Where are you at in your journey? Will you help me and will you help other leaders around our nation and our churches? Will we join together to be courageous in this spirit to fight the good fight of faith in this hour? For all men die, but not all men truly live. The greatest joy in life is to lay down our lives for another. To say, Lord, I love you and I'm going to let my life be a living sacrifice. That my life could be a broken vessel, a poured out offering unto you and for the, the well-being of humanity that you love, and that you care for, that you want to reach, Jesus. I'm not satisfied with a nice church full of people. I'm glad you're all here today and you're watching online. I want to see a city swept under the power of God. I want to see a nation swept under the power of God. And maybe I'm just a little touched like William Wallace. I'm just crazy enough to believe that the same God that we've seen work through history in this Bible and church history would work once again for a people willing to ask. The Holy Spirit wants to make you a threat to forces of injustice, apathy, and complacency that keep our world from flourishing. We are a peculiar people. We are called to shore forth the praises of him who has redeemed us from the powers of darkness. We are called to stand out, not blend in. We are called to be agents of change, to bring his reality to earth, to change darkness into light, to bring salt where there is no taste, where there is no flavor once again. We are called to bring the kingdom of heaven on here, to, to, to lead people to Christ, to heal the sick, to open, even to open the eyes of the blind. That's what we're called to do feed the poor, to take care of the widows. On and on it goes, right? And so now the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into this life of adventure, but it's a risky life of adventure. He will lead you into a dangerous world in order for God to tame it. That's what He wants to do. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever been whitewater rafting? One summer we had the opportunity when our Daughter was younger, and, and we went up. We were in Wyoming on the, up near Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons. And we went on a, I think it was the Snake River. We did a whitewater rafting thing. It was kind of a medium thing, so it wasn't too hard. That was my only experience ever doing whitewater rafting. I would do it again. But I tell you what, if you've done whitewater rafting, it, it's a little bit risky. It's a little bit scary. You're going around, and all of a sudden, that's, that raft is going up and down and sideways. Oh, and by the way, the way you have to work in a team. Everybody kind of rowing the same way, and you got someone kind of piloting this thing and telling you what to do, right? But there's an element of risk and courage that are involved to, to face this thing bravely. Are you with me? You see, sometimes we won't even grow unless there's a challenge to the familiar and comfortable in our lives. And so God will sometimes lead us into places that will take us out of our comfort zones because he's trying to prepare us to move us into something to help bring his order to a world that's full of chaos. Some of my most amazing times of preaching have actually been in the slums of Haiti, in the slums even down in Brazil. Actually, one time in India, I'll never forget, uh, I was supposed to do these big meetings, and I ended up doing these big meetings, thousands of people. But the brother, <laughs> James, him and I are good friends all these years, he, he goes, I want to take you to a place that most pastors don't want to go to, but we have a church that's in the dump in the slums on the outside of the city. Are you, would you be willing to go there the first night and preach to these people? He goes, there may only be 20 or 30 people there, but would you go? I said, yeah, I'll go. It was one of the most humbling experiences, and it smelt. I mean, it was a garbage, garbage dump. Yet there are precious people that are living there in shacks and, and shanties all around that place, and, and Jesus wanted to meet with them and share the gospel with them. You see, some of our greatest adventures happen when we're willing to step out of our comfort zone and to follow him. Let's talk about Caleb. You doing all right today? So we have this wonderful story about Caleb in Joshua 14. 
And uh, Caleb was one of 12 scouts sent to explore the promised land when Israel left Egypt. When the scouts returned, 10 of them said the assignment was impossible. They should return to slavery in Egypt. But it was only Caleb and Joshua that trusted God and said, we can certainly do it. And so let me read this passage here. Now, this is years later. So an entire generation wanders, including Caleb and Joshua, for 40 years in the desert because they were unwilling to believe God at his word and that he'd already given them the land. That entire generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, die in the wilderness. Only their children, when it, only Joshua and Caleb were able to lead their children into the, into the promised land. It's kind of a sad story, isn't it? Let's pick up here, verse 6 of Joshua 14. Now, so they've gone in. Joshua's led them into the promised land. They're conquering the territory like they were supposed to do 40 years prior. They're beginning to conquer the territory. Caleb's right there, and all these younger ones, are they're doing it together, right? It says in verse 6 of Joshua 14, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the uh, Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses. He's holding on to this word 40 years later, like a bulldog on a piece of meat. There needs to be a tenaciousness in our spirit over what God has promised us, church. Amen. You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. You see, there was something different in Caleb's heart. It's in your heart today. How do you see your promise? Well, the promises of God. As I shared last week, we have a Bible that's got 66 books in it full of promises. Your miracle, your promise is in there. What has God spoken to you? What are you believing for, even if it's been 40 years? I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. You see, unbelief can cause a whole generation to miss God's blessing and promise. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. See, it's been now another you know, five years since they went into the promised land. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. Can I have an amen to my gray-haired folks? Come on. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to say this at 85. I know we slow down a little bit as we get older and all that. But listen, I'm talking about living a life in the Spirit that is moving with a forward posture that's saying, listen, I'm not going to go to my grave just sitting watching TV. I'm going to, I want to go with my boots on. I want to go. I want to be in the game. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim, they were the giants, were there and, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. I believe Caleb would have gone all, all by himself if nobody went with him to drive out all the enemies out of Hebron. He just trusted God. Listen, you and God are an army. Everyone can forsake you, but if the Jesus is standing with you, you are an army. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjah Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. You see, it wasn't just Caleb getting his mountain or getting his inheritance or getting Hebron. 
Caleb, because of the breakthrough that he helped bring, brought rest to the land. How would you like to bring a breakthrough to this city that all of a sudden, instead of having fentanyl overdoses and crime problems and immigration issues and poverty, all of a sudden the thing shifts because there's a transformation because God visits a place. That's what I want. We serve a mighty God. He's just looking for people that are willing to have enough courage to say, Listen, you made a promise, God, and we don't have our mountain yet. You made a promise, God, that revival would come to this city and this region. We haven't seen it yet, God. We're going to lay hold of the horns of the altar, and we're going to grab, and we're going to pray, and we're going to keep warring in the Spirit until we see a breakthrough, God. Because it's not just for us. What we're doing here is far more than just having a church of it. It is about bringing a breakthrough, a spiritual breakthrough for a region that's groping in the dark, not realizing the one they're looking for is Jesus. He's right there. You see, the Israelites, 40 years prior, they were more content to wander in the wilderness than to trust God for the promised land. Many today are like this as well. If Jesus is all-powerful and the church is his beloved bride, and if Jesus lives in us and the power of heaven is behind us, and we have Christians in churches all over this nation, why aren't we seeing more happen in the realm of the Spirit? I challenge you today, church, on this Father's Day, let's rise up. He's inviting us to something. It's a reckless faith in the Spirit, so to speak. I'm not saying be reckless in your behavior, but I'm saying be willing to step out of the boat to go after him. Because of Israel's unbelief, Caleb had to spend 40 years of his life wandering through the wilderness. By the time the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, he was 80 years old. Another five years passed before the various tribes were sand land to occupy. He describes it. I just read it there in Joshua 14, 7 and 8. He said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. I'm full of faith. I was full of courage. He goes, nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. We don't want to make the heart of the people melt, do we? We want to build their heart. We want to build in the church A faith to believe for something to shift. You see, the negativity, unbelief, and fear of the ten spies robbed the people of the courageous faith needed to possess what God promised. That generation died in the wilderness. They saw no promise. They saw no inheritance. They saw no fulfillment because the negativity, fear, and unbelief robbed them. Forty-five years later... Caleb, he's not going to rest after a victory because if you read just the preceding chapters here in Joshua, they're taking land, they're conquering it. Caleb's right there. You know he's right there with Joshua and this younger generation and they're going after it. And Caleb, he's seeing victory after victory after victory, but he's not satisfied. You see what happens to many of us, we get satisfied. Get complacent. He goes, no, I want another mountain. At age 85, he wants the mountain God had promised him, and he conquers Hebron Hebron, despite its giants and fortified walls. Caleb was free from a slave mentality and trusted God for additional territory. There's not a leader or a pastor that I've known, I've talked to many over the years, that, that what can happen is we get older in life, we begin to lose the edge. We begin to lose the hunger that maybe we once had. And believe me, it happens in congregations all the time too. Let someone else fight the fight. Let someone else fight the battle. Let someone else take care of the kids. Let someone else do it. And meanwhile, our streets are full of pain. We're called to make a difference in this life. This church, God watches over His Word to perform it. He looks for those who live by faith. He is abundantly ready to bring heaven to earth in this hour. I had a dream this week. And it was, and I, and it, you know, I, when I get God dreams, I know it usually right away. This was a God dream. He's trying to encourage me, but he want, I want to encourage you. In the dream, I, was, I saw a demonic entity in front of me, it was a, but dressed as, a, as a, like a soldier in combat. And this enemy looked ferocious, but it wasn't, he wasn't aimed directly at me, but he's aimed at a different direction and upward. And as I looked upward in the dream, I saw four or five beautiful, powerful 
angels with shields. And this enemy is firing his weapon, but the angels are deflecting every bit of the ammo. None of it was getting towards earth or towards where I'm at. I'm in like a foxhole right at him with my weapon right at him with a helmet on. The helmet of salvation. Nothing's getting to me. And I have this peace. I have this peace because I know I have the helmet of salvation. I know what God's word says. I have my weapon. I have the sword of the spirit. And, and the, but I know God. Psalm 91, the angel of the Lord encamps round about them who fear him to deliver them from evil. The very next thing I saw in the dream, I saw big words like a banner. Believe. One word. Believe. And then I saw scores of people, hundreds, thousands of people. He goes, Bob, even a large auditorium will not contain what I want to do in this city. Yeah. Believe. I don't know about you. This is what's propelled me for 20 years. We've been in this city 21 years from the moment, almost the moment I've been here. I've never been to a place where God has I've been, lived in different parts of the world, ministered overseas, never been to a place like Tucson where he brought almost from the moment is here. He's, I want to do something in this city, the like of which I've not done here. Amen. There's something about this city and about this place. And he wants the church to be revived here and the church to come alive and to walk in the level of his faith, of his power, of his glory, unlike I believe any generation has seen here. Yeah. Believe. Yeah. You might be saying, but pastor, my family's struggling. Listen, when the presence of God and the power of God sweep through churches and through a city, your family will go to another level, will rise above Prosperity will begin to come to a city. Poverty begins to dissipate. No, maybe all the problems don't go away, but all of a sudden things begin to shift, and all of a sudden the light and the glory of Christ begins to dispel the darkness. I believe that we can pray in such a way that the power of God can come, so all of a sudden human traffickers and drug smugglers, all of a sudden, boom, they're stopped at the border. I actually believe that our prayers are that powerful that it can make a difference, church. But it takes people of faith who are willing to get off the couch, to serve in the church, to come out and pray, and to say we're not going to stop until we see heaven invade earth. Amen. But here's the problem. Negative thinking and lack of faith often hinders us from seeing the breakthroughs or inheriting God's promises. Hebrews 6.12 says, Do not become sluggish, lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I, I don't want to finish my day, whatever, whenever that point in time comes and I stand before the Lord, I don't want one promise left unfulfilled because I didn't fight the good fight of faith. I like what Hebrews 6.12 says in the message translation. Don't drag your feet. Be like those who stay the course with committed faith and then get everything promised to them. You see, if you and I become spiritually lazy, or we lose the edge by drawing back from hot pursuit of God, you will no longer look for bigger mountains. If you allow fear or uncertainty to rule, you will lose the courageous faith needed to live a life of fulfillment and victory. You and I were not created for mediocre living. You were not created just to get by. You were created to live a life of audacious, risky faith in God, united with Jesus Christ and realize He's the most glorious, wonderful, amazing Father. He loves us with an everlasting love. And He would not, He wants us to be released and out and broken out of that fear. To Joshua, he said, be strong and of good courage. It takes courage to face reality with hope and optimism. It takes courage to admit need, to commit to change, to make decisions, and to hold to convictions. Courageous faith absorbs chaos and releases God's peace in a turbulent world. Courageous faith is brave and provides hope in our time. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Notice the all in all, all things are possible. When God's at the center, just believe, church. With Jesus, impossibilities are the atmosphere for faith to thrive. Impossible situations did not intimidate Jesus. He wanted his followers to look at situations with God's perspective. Faith and expectation can change even the most daunting circumstances. Listen, courage isn't devoid of fear. 
I've done street evangelism different places. Remember one time, Carolyn and I, we did some street evangelism down in Haiti. She was actually pregnant with our daughter, Hannah, and we were in the very slum part of Port-au-Prince in Haiti. It was so, so bad. It was in the marketplace area. People, because they don't have restrooms and things available, I mean, it just smelt. It was horrible. It's hot. It's horrible. Flies. And down in Haiti, they let the meat just hang there. Sometimes it'll hang there for a couple of days before. It's just flies everywhere. It's like your senses are assaulted. You're, 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 and yet, and, and people, and demonized people, all, and yet Jesus, will you preach to these right there? Her and I just preached and we ministered. We saw people stop and people ask more questions. Are you with me, church? Sometimes he wants us to be, step out of the boat and get into a risky place. That's a bit... You get, you're in those situations, I mean, to say that you don't have any fear, that would be a lot. I mean, there's always a bit of trepidation. Rather, despite the fear, you see courage, it presses forward bravely. However, negativity linked to doubt and unbelief, it's cancerous. It robs us of faith. It'll, it'll rob congregations. It'll rob a city. It'll rob a nation of its destiny. You see, if you and I, if we have a negative attitude and small faith when we're younger, let's say age 40, there's a good chance you will have a negative attitude and small faith when, let's say, you're age 85. Because there's a good chance you won't ever make it to 85. Some of you need to hear that. If you're negative when you're younger and you can't get rid of the negativity and get free of the bondages of, of that stuff that's held you, you're probably are not going to live a long life. Several years ago, psychologist Martin Siegelman he studied several hundred people in a religious community, divided them into four groups, from the most optimistic, faith-filled, to those who were the least optimistic. He found 90% of the most optimistic, faith-filled people were still alive at 85. 90%. Only 34% of the most negative, pessimistic people made it to that age. Listen, you want to be full of faith. I shared the story of Carolyn's Aunt Betty who just passed here just a, a few weeks ago, age 101. You know one of the things I always remember about Betty? This was a woman who was always positive. Amen. She was always doing things with her mind, with her hand. She was very creative, beautiful painter. She did, she just, and she, always, she just loved and smiled. And she was grateful. I remember one time we were there visiting. I think she was about age 95. And I, so Carolyn's there with her, with, her, with her Aunt Betty and her other Aunt Kathy, and she's in there talking to them. I went, she lived right by the beach there in Flagler Beach, Florida. And so I went to the beach, and I went fishing that afternoon. I did, it was hot. It was August, I think. I didn't catch hardly anything. I caught two small fish. I mean, I, 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 mean, I could exaggerate, but they were, like, they were like about this big, 10 inches, maybe 12 inches, maybe 14. No, they were about 10 inches, okay? <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, should I even keep these fish? He goes, yes, because Betty would like them. So I kept, I was actually embarrassed. I bring these two small fish. They were whiting fish. They're actually very tasty, very tasty fish you can catch off the coast there. But usually the nicer ones are a little bit bigger. So I bring these two whiting fish in. I go, Betty, I just felt, you know, to keep these two fish. I don't know if you, she goes, Bob, thank you. I love whiting. I'll fillet these up. I'll make, 95 years old. Thank you so much for catching those fish and bringing them to me. You see, thankfulness, positivity. I was watching the news the other night here, channel, I think it was Channel 4. There was a lady in town when we hit 109 the other day, literally in a retirement home in the north, I think, northwest part of Tucson, there was a lady, I forget her name, that turned 109, and they were celebrating her 109th birthday when we hit 109 degrees. And they asked this lady, I forget her name, what, I'm watching this on the news this week. They go, what do you attribute your long life to? She was all bubbly. She was, mine was alert at 109. Alert. She goes, I was a ballroom dancer. <laughs> she goes, I danced. She goes, I loved it. You know, it just kept me happy. It kept me, she goes, it kept me active. It kept me alert. I stayed involved with people. You see, listen, negativity will rob us. But positivity, being optimistic, being faithful, this life-giving, the Spirit of God rests on that. Twelve spies went out. Only Joshua and Caleb had faith. They said, we can do it. Let's go do it. The other ten spies said, nope, can't be done. Let's go back, be slaves in Egypt. Forty-five years later, Joshua and Caleb were still alive, and Caleb's as feisty as ever. Guess what happened to the other ten by then? 
They're dead. They all died in the wilderness. None of them made it to Caleb's age. I love what Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England, said during World War II. You know, if it wasn't for Churchill, our world might be a different place. Do you realize that? Because he had enough courage to stand against the tyranny of the Nazis, right? He said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. You and I go through failures all the time. We get set back. We get hit. Things happen. You have to go from one failure to the next with a smile on your face. Say, I forgive. I release. I move on. Let's go. Because there's a mountain. Because there's a generation that needs to hear the good news. I don't have time to fall back into that stuff. I once lived there. But that was my past. He has freed me from that. You want to hear a great missionary story? This one's for the ladies on this Father's Day. Yes, you ladies need this one too. There was a missionary, Evelyn Brand, and as a single, you know, this is about 100 years ago. She was a single woman. And this was 1909. She felt called to the mission field uh, to go to India. And uh, now at that time, to be a, a woman, a single woman, to go on a mission field like that, that took a lot of faith and determination. She married a young man named Jesse, and together they began this ministry in rural er- 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 India, bringing education, medical supplies. They built roads to reduce isolation of the poor. Early in their ministry, they went seven years without a single convert. I can't imagine seven years without a convert. Then a priest of a local uh, tribal religion, I believe it was Hinduism, developed a fever and became deathly ill. Nobody else would go near him, but Evelyn and Jesse did. They nursed him as he was dying. Before he died, he said, This God, Jesus, must be the true God because only Jesse and Evelyn will care for me in dying. The priest gave his children to them to care for after he died. They said that that became a spiritual turning point for that region. People began to examine their life, the life teachings of Jesus, and began to follow him in increasing numbers. Evelyn and Jesse spent 13 years together of productive service. Then Jesse dies at age 50 in India. Everybody say, but God. Everyone expected Evelyn to go back to England. She wouldn't return. You could say she was as feisty as Caleb was. She had courageous faith. She knew what God called her to. You see, Daniel 11.32 says, Those who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Evelyn's son Paul went to see her when she was age 70, still laboring there in India. He said, this is how to grow old. Allow everything else to fall away until those around you see only love. Love gives. Love serves. Love doesn't just seek its own. Love love will pour out for others. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 say this, challenges us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. That's a whole other message right there. How do you keep going? You keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep looking at him. You keep strong in him. Toward the end of Evelyn's life, everyone called her Granny Brand. She'd spent her life in India, 20 years as a widow. At eight, again, right about the time Paul visited her at age 70, she got word from the missions office in England that they were not going to give her another five-year term. You're too old! They felt that she was simply needed to come home. It would be for her own best. You know, she's old, but she's stubborn. They threw her a party in India to celebrate her time there. She told them, I'll tell you a little secret. I'm not going back home. I'm staying in India. That's not, you know, I've met some of you that are kind of like this, okay? You're just like, <laughs> Evelyn had a little shack built with some of the resources that she smuggled in. She had bought a pony to get around the mountains, and this elderly woman would ride from village to village on horseback. She did this for five years telling them about Jesus. One day at age 75, she fell off and broke her hip. Her, her son Paul said to her, Mom, you've had a great run. God has used you. It's time to turn it over. You come back home. She replied, I'm not going back home. God, give me another mountain. 
She spent another 18 years traveling from one village to another on horseback. Falls, concussions, sicknesses, and aging could not stop her. Finally, when she hit 93, she could not ride on the horseback any longer. So men in villages, because they loved Granny Brand so much, put her on a stretcher and carried her from village to village. She lived two more years and gave those years as a gift, carried on a stretcher to help the poorest of the poor. She died at age 95, but never retired. She just graduated. You want to die with your boots on, church. Come on. I'm all for having a little vacation time, having a little rest again. We slow down as we age. He's called us to something that is beyond just having a retirement. Listen, I don't know about you, but I, most people I know that are healthy... They don't want to be a person who dies without truly living. Amen. Remember the words of William Wallace. All men die. All people die, but not everyone truly lives. There's more church. True living is found in Christ. He invites us to know him. If you don't know him today, say yes to Jesus today. If, you're, if you've wandered from him, say yes to him. He invites us to know him, to grow in him, and to live a life fulfilled, abundant life of purpose in him. From our life in Christ, we discover meaning in being a good friend, sibling, parent, grandparent, neighbor, co-worker, and servant of Christ in his church and to the world. Amen. You can live courageously when you're confident of your life in Christ and purpose. You don't care. Though a thousand may fall, as I shared last week, a thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, it will not come near me because the Lord is my light and my strength and my salvation. Closing here, Caleb and Evelyn didn't look for comfort. They lived lives of courageous faith and were willing to risk until they passed. You see, life isn't about comfort. It's about saying, God, give me another mountain. I thank God for air conditioning, nice buildings, nice homes we have. But don't, let's not be trapped by that. The reason we're not seeing the breakthrough and revival in our nation is because the church has been too comfortable for too long. We need to say, God, give me another mountain. Church, I don't know about you. Can you say that today? God, give me another mountain. It might look like Granny Brand. It might look a little bit like Caleb. Your life story might be known and might not be told. No one may know your story but you and God. It doesn't matter. The question is, are you willing to live a life of courageous, obedient faith? Remember the words of William Wallace, every man dies, not every man really lives. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8 real quick. Last scripture. The Lord dropped this in my spirit this morning. It's amazing. Paul is, you know, this is, this is the last letter that Paul wrote. And, you know, he, in verse 6 he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And then all of a sudden in verse 7 and 8, he just says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Don't you want that to be your valedictory I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith verse 8 finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only but also to all who love loved is appearing wow Paul knew this wasn't just for him But for everyone that could say, yes, Lord, I have labored for you. I have fought the good fight. I have not given up, God. I continue to stay steadfast in you and to preach your your gospel and how you're the Savior, the the lover of our souls, the the healer, the deliverer, the soon-coming king. God, I want to stand strong in you. And God, I thank you there's a crown of righteousness for me and for all who love your appearing. That's how we want to finish, church. Would you go ahead and stand? Learn to trust God for things only He can do. That's faith. I want to talk a lot the next couple of weeks about vision and how to practically get there, how to see your mountains realized, your visions realized that God has given you. You see, living the adventure God planned and becoming the person God created you to be is not one pursuit among many. It's why you and I were born. Who is it that He created you to be? 
What is your calling? What is your purpose? What are you laboring for in this hour? It's worth wanting above all else. Go after it. Ask God for your mountain and then dare to risk all to follow him. And don't stop asking for another mountain through every season and journey in your life. My prayers for you and for I during these days of opportunity. Yes, these are days of opportunity. We'll be empowered by God who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power to be courageous followers and leaders in our walk with God and our relationships and families and wherever God should lead us. Father, I pray right now, if you need courage, just, just raise your hands high. Father, I pray for courage right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, for an impartation from heaven. Lord, even as you sent the angel to Daniel and you said, be strong, do not fear. God, I pray just release courage right now to face those situations they're facing. God, every one of us needs to be strengthened, God. I pray just a strengthening to every individual, every person, God, right now by your Spirit. And God, I pray the courage, God, to, to step out and to risk where you are guiding and where you are leading, God, and to, Lord, to, that their lives would make a difference, God. And I pray for our church, God, and churches like ours all over this city and all over this nation. God, that in this hour, God, we could be the light in the darkness, God. We could see your spirit move and many be touched by your love and power and many come to Christ in this hour, God. We just love you, Jesus. So on this Father's Day, Father, I'm asking, bless each one with your love, your faith, and your courage. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear. For I am with you always, says the Lord. Bless your people with peace, God. In Jesus' name, amen. They love him, church. Come on, he's amazing. <laughs>